Okay, so in the last session, we talked about asymmetric encryption. And we said that the idea is that you have two keys now. You have a public key and a private key. And the public key is known to everyone. It's used to encrypt the message. The private key is known only by one person. We call her Alice. And it's used to decrypt the message. So anyone can send messages to Alice, but only Alice can read those messages. Now, we talked about this setting. And we also saw our first example uh, of a public key system, which was El Gaman. But then we talked about RSA and we talked about the intuition behind RSA, but we couldn't get a working RSA encryption. So just to go over this again, the idea was very simple. We said that we're going to choose a modulus again, just as before. I'm going to call my modulus N because in the last session I showed that you cannot use a prime modulus. And then the idea was that whenever I want to encrypt a message M, I just raise it to the power of my encryption key. So my encryption key is just a number. My message is also a number. Again, we don't really distinguish between numbers and strings in this course. So I just raise my message to the power of my encryption key. And I say, that's the encryption. And I want my decryption to also be very simple. I want my decryption to be basically the same as my encryption, except that I'm using the decryption key. So I want to take this encrypted message and just raise it to the power of the decryption key. And I want to say, this is the result of decrypting it. Now, of course, we always need to have this property that if I take a message and encrypt it and then decrypt it, I should get the same message back. But here, if I take a message and encrypt it and then decrypt it, I'll just get that message to the power of E times D, right? So the property that I need to have is that for every message M, M to the power of E times D should be equal to N, okay? And we also talked about what the eavesdropper Eve can see. So she cannot see the message, but she can see the encrypted message, which is M to the power of E. And also everyone knows N and E. Everyone knows the modulus, everyone knows the public key. So I'm assuming that Eve knows that as well. But of course, Eve does not know the private key or the decryption key D. And based on this, we wanted to say that Eve cannot find M. Now our first attempt in the last session, which actually failed, was to say that Let's say my modulus n is just a prime number because this was what had worked for us in El Gamal. So we just said, let's try the same thing here. So we needed to choose our E and D such that M to the power of E D becomes equal to M modulo P. And we had to have this for every message M. And we said that this basically means that M to the power of E D minus one should be one, but then we have Fermat's little theorem, so we know that anything to the power of p minus one is one. So it was enough for us to make sure that e d minus one is a multiple of p minus one. So I'm taking m, I'm looking at all of its powers, I'm creating that cycle coming back to one. I know that if I take p minus one steps, I will always come back to one. But instead of p minus one, I'm taking e d minus one steps. So I want that to be a multiple of p minus one so that I just go around that cycle several times. That was the idea. But then basically, if all I need is this, the problem I had here was that, let, let's just again look at what Eve knows. So Eve knows p, so she can calculate p minus one. She also knows p because e is just public knowledge. Everyone knows it. So the question was, if I know all of these things, can I somehow calculate D? And in the last session, we saw that actually, unfortunately, yes, I can calculate D. And that's because I basically had these equalities. So ED minus one uh, was supposed to be a multiple of P minus one, which means that ED minus one should be zero modulo P minus one. But then if I just move this minus one to the other side, I get that ED should be equal to one modulo P minus one. But that just means that D should be the inverse of E modulo P minus one. And for those of you who attended the guest lecture yesterday, you know how to calculate inverses. 
So generally, calculating inverses is not hard. This is just what we call the extended Euclidean algorithm. So now I have a problem. And the problem is that the attacker E, she knows P because everyone knows P. So she can calculate P minus one. She also knows E. And also calculating modular multiplicative inverses is easy. It's an algorithm actually with logarithmic runtime. So anyone who knows the public key can just calculate my private key. But that's awful because that means everyone can basically decrypt all the messages, right? So of course, I still have the property that if I encrypt something and decrypt it, I get the same message back. But at this point, it's really stupid because everyone can do both of the operations. Now, again, this was mainly the topic of the previous session, but I just want you to remember that I cannot use a prime number as my modulus here. If I want my encryption and decryption to be just this simple algorithms that raise the message to the power of the key, I cannot use a prime modulus. Okay, so let's now do something else. Let's use a modulus that is not a prime. So this is our second attempt. And this one is going to work. And this is actually what RSA is. Okay, so this is real RSA. Now, I want to choose a modulus N. I know that I cannot choose a prime number, but I like prime numbers because I have Fermat's little theorem and all of those nice things. So I choose the closest thing. I just take two prime numbers and I multiply them together. So my modulus is not going to be prime, but it's close. It just has two prime factors. So this is what I'm going to do. Instead of saying, let n be a prime number p, I say it like this. I say, let n be p times q, where p and q are prime numbers. And again, I want these prime numbers to be large. OK, and by large, I mean whatever, 1,024 bits or longer. And there are algorithms that would give you large prime numbers, so don't worry about finding large prime numbers. You just find two large prime numbers, you multiply them together, you say, this is my n. And by the way, here's the thing that is interesting. This n is going to be our modulus, so we're going to say all calculations are modulo n. Right, so n has to be public, right? Because when someone wants to encrypt and send me a message, they have to do that calculation, that encryption modulo n, so they need to know n. But I'm going to keep the two uh, prime numbers, p and q, private. So actually, if I want to continue using my color coding here, n is p times q, where p and q are private. So again, let's say I'm Alice, only I know what P and Q are. But I'm giving N to everyone. Okay. Now, already we're going to uh, rely on a problem that is kind of known to be hard. So if you have a large number, you cannot factorize it fast. Okay. Again, this is not something that has a proof. It's just a problem that people have been working on for a long time and no one has a solution. So if I give you a huge number, no one knows how to factorize it. And that's the idea here. That's why I can publish N, but I can say that P and Q are still private because they're so big that I trust that no one can factorize it. Okay. Now, let's do the same thing as before. So uh, let's say that we have two keys. So by the way, uh, I'm saying let n be this, but actually p and q and n, all of these are going to be chosen by Alice. And Alice is the recipient of the messages, the person who can do the decryption. So maybe in, instead of this, let me just say Alice chooses this. 
Now, Alice has to also choose a public key for others to send messages to her and a private key for herself to decrypt the messages. So I also need to say that Alice chooses two keys. Again, I'm going to have a public key or an encryption key E, and I'm going to have a private or decryption key D. And of course, all of my numbers are modulo N, right? So all of these public keys and private keys, they're going to be in the range one, two to N minus one. Now, what is the property that I want? I said that I want my encryption and decryption to be these simple formulas, right? So I'm just going to copy these formulas. So I have this. When I encrypt a message M using the public key E, I just raise M to the power of E. And when I want to decrypt a message M prime, I just raise that M prime to the power of my private key T. Okay. Now, of course, I need to have the same property as all of our encryption schemes. I need to say that if I encrypt and then decrypt, I get the same message, right? So I have this, I have to say that for every M, and again, this M is modulo N minus one, let's say, uh, Oh, I have to say one more thing. So I'm going to assume that my messages are not multiples of P and Q. Okay. Because that's when the whole thing would break. So if someone wants to send a message and if someone wants to send P as a message, right? What does that mean? That means that they already know P. And if they know P, they can just check that n is a multiple of p, they can find the prime factorization of n. But we're assuming that that's not possible. So the way to look at this is that I'm going to choose this n to be really large. So if you want to send me any message, and your message is usually the hash of something, let's say, it's very unlikely that you randomly pick a message that is not co-prime to n, that is a multiple of either p or q. That's not going to happen. So for all of my messages, and generally for all of my numbers in this protocol, I'm going to assume that they're co-prime to n. Because if anyone finds a number that is not co-prime to n, they have basically found uh, n's uh, prime factorization. They have found either p or q, and then they can find the other one. And then at that point, the whole system is broken, right? But I'm assuming no one can do that. So whenever I write for every message M, I mean for every M that is co-prime to N, okay? So for every message M, I want this. I want to say that if I first encrypt M using E, and then I decrypt it using the private key D, I want to get M back, okay? But the encryption of M, was just m to the power of e. And the decryption of this is to just take it and raise it to the power of d. So this whole left-hand side is just m to the power of e times d. And this should be equal to m. And of course, remember, all of our calculations are modulo n. So this is modulo n, and this is also modulo n. So for every message, I should have this, m to the power of n times d is m modulo n. OK. Now, to have this, it's enough to just have m to the power of e d minus 1 is 1 modulo n, right? I'm just dividing both sides by m. OK, and again, this is for every m. <laughs> now, here's the part where. Uh, things change. So previously, I was doing my calculations modulo a prime number, and I saw that everything becomes bad. But here, I know that this n is just p times q, right? So I have something, this left-hand side, which is 1 modulo p times q. 
So this thing has to also be one modulo P and one modulo Q. Does that make sense? So basically I have this, I have that M to the power of E times D minus one is one modulo P and also M to the power of E times D minus one is one modulo Q. Look, this is very intuitive. I have this thing and it's remainder when divided by P times Q is one, right? So this thing, this left-hand side, is P times Q times something else plus one. If I divide it by P, that P times Q times something else is going to vanish, and then I will have a remainder of one. If I divide it by Q, I will also have a remainder of one. And actually, this goes in both sides because we have something called the Chinese remainder theorem. So search for this on Wikipedia, or maybe we will have Harshit explain this again to you. But basically the idea is that this number is one modulo P and one modulo Q if and only if it is one modulo M, okay? And generally speaking, if I give you the remainder of a number modulo P and its remainder modulo Q, you can always calculate its remainder modulo P times Q. Okay. Now, this is what I know. Now, at this point, I can do the same thing that I did in the last session. I can use Fermat's little theorem on each of these two equalities, right? So I have M and I'm saying that M to some power has to be one modulo P, but P is now a prime number. So it's enough if this power is just a multiple of P minus one, right? So if ED minus one is a multiple of P minus one, I'm sure that this equality would hold because of Fermat's little theorem. And then I can say the same thing here. I can say that if ED minus one is a multiple of Q minus one, then this equality definitely holds because of Fermat's little theorem, again. right? So I need ED minus one to be a multiple of both P minus one and Q minus one. Well, I don't need, need it to be that, but it's sufficient. So uh, I just say, let me write in black. It is sufficient for Alice to choose these two numbers, E and D, such that E D minus one is a multiple of both Q minus one and P minus one. Okay. Now, basic like middle school algebra, if something is a multiple of two things, it's a multiple of their lowest common multiple, right? So I'm just going to say let L, actually, let me write with a different color. Let L be the lowest common multiple of P minus one and Q minus one, okay? All I need to make sure is that E times D minus one is a multiple of L, okay? So Alice has to, choose E and D such that L is a divisor of E D minus one. But what is another way of writing this? Another way of writing this is that E D minus one is zero modulo this L, which was the lowest common multiple of P minus one and Q minus one, which means that E D is one modulo L, right? Which means that E is the inverse of D modulo L, right? So E is D inverse modulo L. Or I could also write it in the other way around. I could just say that D is E inverse modulo L. Both of them are basically the same. Now, 
So Alice can find this kind of E and D very simply. The algorithm for Alice, and we call this key generation, is now very simple. So this is the key generation algorithm for Alice. So remember that first she just chooses two large prime numbers, two large primes, P and Q, and she keeps them to herself. Okay. And then in the second step, she just calculates N, which is P times Q. And when I'm writing something in blue, it means that it's published to everyone. So everyone can see N. Now in the third step, she wants to choose either E or D. She can choose whichever she wants. She can choose E and then compute D based on it, or she can choose D and compute E based on it. But let's say that she chooses D. So choose a random decryption key D, and this decryption key should be between one, two to N minus one, right? Now, of course, we have to make sure that D does not leak any of our prime numbers. Uh, and also E does not leak any of our prime numbers, but that's fine. I, I will do it in the end. So uh, because I'm taking it randomly, it's very unlikely that it would happen. Now, what is the next step? I just say compute E. Now, what is E? E is just going to be the inverse of D. So you take D and you inverse it, but modulo what? Modulo the least common multiple of P minus one and Q minus one. Right? And then finally, I say publish all of them. Publish uh, basically N and E. Okay. Now, again, the special case here, which is very unlikely, is that I say if the GCD of D and N is not one, choose a different D. Right? Uh, okay. That's fine. Uh, and actually, oh, sorry. I It's better if I do it with this one, right? So here I do it. I say if the GCD of E and N is not one, which is, again, completely unlikely, then choose a different D and E. Okay. But this is just a special case. Like, I don't want to leak the uh, prime factorization of N. I want to make sure that P and Q remain known only to Alice. Okay. Now, why is this secure if the previous protocol when we were just using a prime number was not secure? You see, previously, what happens here uh, was that my private key was the inverse of my public key modulo P minus one. But everyone knew P minus one because everyone knew P. So everyone could calculate this inverse. But now, if you look here, they are also inverses of each other, but they're now inverses modulo this number, the lowest common multiple of P minus one and Q minus one. Now, if you know P and Q, of course you can just calculate P minus one and Q minus one then calculate their lowest common multiple and then calculate this inverse. But if you don't know P and Q, how are you going to find this modulus, right? So this is where our security is coming from because now I'm in a situation where only Alice knows P and Q. So if I have 
an eavesdropper Eve. What does Eve see? Eve sees N and she also sees E, right? But that's not enough to calculate D. D would of course be the inverse of E modulo this number, but I mean, Eve doesn't know this number. Eve doesn't know P minus one and Q minus one. She doesn't know their lowest common multiple. Okay, so that's the idea. But let's just uh, draw our rectangles again as before. So let's say I have Alice here, I have Bob here, and I have Eve here who sees everything that goes in between. Okay, so this is Eve. This is Alice, this is Bob. And by the way, Bob is not unique here because we are doing public key cryptography. So I might have many different Bobs, right? Now, what's going to happen here? Well, Alice chooses P and Q, which are prime numbers. And then she calculates N, which is P times Q and sends it to Bob. Now I say sends it to Bob, but she actually publishes it. So everyone knows this. So N, which is P times Q is published. Okay. Now she knows her secret key D. She of course also knows the public key E and she's also publishing that. So let's say she also publishes E. And now let's say Bob wants to send a private message M to Alex. We said that the encryption of the message would just be the message to the power of the encryption key. So Bob is just going to send M to the power of E, of course, modulo N to Alice, right? And of course, based on this, I know that Alice can calculate M because she can just take this message and raise it to the power of D. And all of this mathematics that we did here was so that we could prove that M to the power of ED is indeed equal to M. So Alice can get this message back by just raising this thing that she received from Bob to the power of D. But now let's look at it from Eve's point of view. What is Eve seeing? Eve sees M. She sees E, she sees M to the power of E. She does not see P, Q, D, or M. So again, this is the part where it's a little bit awkward. We don't have a proof that Eve cannot decrypt these. It's just an assumption. It's that a lot of people tried to do it for several decades. No one knows how to do it. Okay, so this is what we call the RSA assumption or the RSA security assumption. It's just this, given all these values, given the values that Eve is seeing, so N, E, and M to the power of E mod N, uh, without knowing the private values, without knowing basically or D, it is hard to find these private values. And to find any of the private values. Now, here's the thing. It's really important that Eve does not know any of these private values, right? Because we don't know how to solve this. We don't know how to find M, P, Q, or D if we have all those public values. But imagine if I have one of the private values. So first of all, if I have M, that's already knowing the message. That's awful, right? If I know P, I can easily find Q because I know that N is P times Q. So I just divide N by P, I get Q. And as soon as I have P and Q, I can actually also find D, right? Because I can just uh, 
say that D is the inverse of E modulo this LCM, and I can now calculate the LCM. So even leaking one of the prime numbers is enough for this whole uh, security to go out the door. And of course, if someone knows your private key, if someone knows D, they can basically do whatever you could do. They can also do decryption so they can read all of your messages. So don't share your private keys with anyone. Okay, so leaking any of these four is catastrophic. Now, this is the RSA assumption. Let me see what's the next thing I should cover. Ah, okay. Now, here's the thing that we talked about when we were doing one-time pad, and it was this idea that one-time pad not only doesn't allow Eve to skip the message, it actually doesn't allow Eve to have any information about the message. Remember that? So the idea was that when I'm sending a message with one time pad, if cannot distinguish between any of the messages. But that's not really the case here, right? So I don't have that strong security guarantee of no information. And you see it here. So when I'm writing the RSA assumption, I'm not saying that he finds no information about our private uh, values. I'm just saying that if cannot compute our private values. To be more specific, if cannot find any useful information about them, but I don't want to really get into formally defining what information is useful and what's not useful. But I just want to show you that if can get some information, definitely. So let me just copy this again. And just to show you that this is not as good as one-time pad. So in one-time pad, if I sent an encrypted message, it could, could not rule out any of the possibilities for the original message, right? So if my message M was, let's say, a string of 256 bits, and I was using one-time pad, I would just send a string of 256 bits, which was the encrypted message, and from Eve's point of view, all the two to the power of 256 uh, messages were possible, right? But here, that's not the case, right? So here's the thing. If Eve wants to check whether my message is a particular value, so let's say I have this situation. Eve wants to check if the message is something specific. So for example, if the message is, let's say one, two, three, four, right? She can do that because, well, you just take this message and you encrypt it and everyone can do encryption, right? And then you just check, is this the same as the encrypted message that Bob sent to Alice, right? So this is easy. It's just encrypt M or encrypt one, two, three, four to get one, two, three, four to the power of the encryption key and then check. So let's call this one, I don't know. Let's call it alpha. Check if alpha is the same as the encrypted message that was sent, m to the power of it. And if it is, you have successfully decrypted it. So if you can somehow guess the message, you can verify your guess, right? We didn't have this kind of thing when we were doing one-time pad. In one-time pad, even if you had a guess about the message, there was no way to verify it. So here I can actually rule out a bunch of things, right? So I. If I know that my messages are always numbers between one and 1,000, I can just do a brute force attack, right? I can try encrypting all the possible messages between one and 1,000 and just checking, was this encrypted message one of the encryptions of those particular messages? So we have a situation very similar to what we had for hashing. We have to make sure that however we're sending these messages, 
the range of possible messages, or actually the domain of the encryption function, which is the range of the decryption function, should be huge. It should be something that cannot be brute forced by ETH. Okay. So now you can do something very similar to what we were doing with hashes. You can just include some nonsense. You want to send a message? Instead of just sending that message, append some nonsensical nonce to it and send that. And now you're sure that Eve cannot do a brute force attack, but Alice can decrypt it. And let's say we have decided that the first half of the message is the actual message and the second half is nonsense, for example. And she can be sure that uh, you can be sure that only Alice can get it. Okay. So we don't have that uh, strong security property of saying that there is no information leak. But again, as I said before, uh, we think that RSA does not leak any useful information. Uh, you can take the graduate algorithm, graduate cryptography course for the definition of useful information. Okay. Now, another issue that I want to talk about is that when we were talking about one-time path, I told you that you should never reuse your keys. Right, never use the same key more than once. Would it create a problem here if I reuse my keys? So let's look at this. So let's say key reuse. Um, by the way, I definitely need to use my keys several times here because that was the whole point. Right. I wanted to just give a public key to everyone so that everyone can use that same key to send me their messages. That's the whole point of asymmetric cryptography. So there is no way around this. I have to make sure that uh, these keys can be reused. But what's the problem if the keys are reused? So let's say I send two different messages or maybe even two different people send Alice two different messages. So let's say... Bob and Carol send the messages M1 and M2 to Alice. <coughs> okay. Now we have to again think what does Eve see? So uh, what is the public information that is just given to everyone. So public information visible to Eve. Of course, she knows everything that we listed here, but for both messages. So she already knew the modulus N and she knows the public key E, but she's also seeing the first message to the power of E and she's seeing the second message to the power of E, right? Now, what can she do? Well, she can multiply these two numbers, right? So let's see what happens. Let's say I take the encryption of M1, which was M1 to the power of E, and I multiply it by the encryption of M2. So what I get here is, again, M1 to the power of E, times m2 to the power of e, which is just m1 times m2 to the power of e, right? And of course, this is the encryption of m1 times m2. Okay, is this a problem for us? Which kind of... This is actually what we call the homomorphic property of RSA. So RSA is homomorphic in the sense that basically encryption of two messages, I can take encryption of M1 times M2. Uh, encryption of the product is basically the product of encryptions. Now, does this really leak any useful information? Well, again, the question is, can this lead to some real information about M1 times M2? 
again, if your messages are such that when you multiply them together, they, there is some, uh, like let's say limited range for the multiplications, then yeah, maybe you can first find the encryption of n1 times n2 and then try to brute force it. But generally speaking, this doesn't create much of a problem for us at this point. It will create a lot of problems for us later on when we use uh, digital signatures based on RSA. Okay. But for now, all I have here is that, well, she knows the encryption of M1 and the encryption of M2. Eve knows it. She can compute the encryption of M1 times M2. And generally, if she knows the encryption of a bunch of messages, she can compute the encryption of any multiplication of these messages, any product of these messages. Okay. Now, one thing we can do is to make sure all of our messages contain some garbage. All of our messages have some nonces or some hashes or something in them so that the multiplication of our messages doesn't really mean anything, right? If we are sure about that, then we are kind of sure that here, we're not really leaking any useful information. There is nothing for Eve to gain from doing this kind of thing. Yeah, but generally speaking, we're going to reuse our keys and that's not a problem for us. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about digital signatures. So, up until now, we had two people or several people who wanted to send messages to each other. And we were worried that someone else might see our message. We wanted to encrypt to make sure only the recipient can decrypt and see the message, right? Now I'm going to introduce a new type of adversary. And this is the adversary who would actually try to change the message, okay? So just as before, I have Alice here, I have Bob here. Uh, so this is Alice, this is Bob, and there is someone in between. Oops. This time I'm going to give him a different name. Let's call him Charlie. And Alice wants to send a message to Bob or Bob wants to send a message to Alice. But now we don't really care about the privacy of this message. We just care that the message does not change, right? So Bob has this message M and he's going to just send it directly to Alice, right? I don't care that Charlie sees it. Or again, this is uh, completely symmetric so I can have this kind of situation as well. Alice maybe wants to send a message M to Bob. I don't care that someone sees it in the middle, but what I care about is that I wanna make sure this message was not changed. Because again, maybe Charlie is a UST or Charlie is like your government or internet service provider, and maybe they just wanna change the messages that you're sending, right? So Bob receives some message, some M, and he doesn't know if it was actually the message that Alice sent or it was a message that was changed by Charlie on the way. So we need to somehow verify that the message M really came from Alice. So how to verify that M came from Alice? This is our problem. And of course, you see the metaphor here and why we're calling it a digital signature, because in the real world, again, if you have, let's say, a message on a piece of paper and you want to make sure that it's from Alice, you would just ask Alice to sign it. And if you have some way of verifying Alice's signature, you can make sure that this message really came from Alice, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to basically have a digital version of signatures. I want to be able to sign a message. So this is again what I want. I would like to have a function that creates a signature. Now, uh, I would like this. 
let's say a function sign that takes messages and gives me other messages. So the idea here is that sign of M is basically Alice's signature on M. Now, one interesting point here is that I don't have a fixed signature for Alice. I'm saying Alice's signature differs based on what the message is. And this is because unlike the real world, anything that you have in the digital world can be copied, right? So if I have the same signature, if I have a signature on let's say one particular PDF file, so my message M is, let's say, a PDF file, and I've signed it. And if that signature is not somehow dependent on the contents of the file, someone can just copy this signature and put it on another file. right? But I don't want that to happen. I don't want anyone to be able to copy my signature. So my signature should actually depend on the message. So as you see here, I'm going to have a sign function which maps messages to signatures on them. Okay, I should also have a verification function. So someone else, if they see my signature and my message, they have to be able to verify whether this is really my signature and whether it is uh, really on that message. So now for verify, people actually do two different definitions and we will use both of these definitions. You can use whichever you want. So the first definition is that I give you two strings and it's a function that maps them to zero and one. So basically the idea here is that the verify of M and S is one if S is a valid signature on M. Valid signature by Alice. So basically what I'm saying is that there is a function for verifying signatures and if you give it the message and you also give it the signature, it will return a boolean. It will tell you whether the signature is valid or not. This is one way of looking at verification. The other way of looking at verification is that I give you the signature and you give me the original message. Right. So another way of looking at verification is that it's a function from sigma star to sigma star. And basically, if the verification of S gives me M, this means that S is a valid signature by Alice on M. Okay. You can see why both types are useful and both types are actually modeling the same idea. Here, the idea is that the signature does not really include the message itself. So I'm giving you the message and the signature and you're verifying whether it's a valid signature. In this second one, the signature kind of already includes the message built into it, right? So when I give you the signature, you can just give me the message and say that this was a valid signature on this particular message. Now, it doesn't really matter which one of these definitions you use. What really matters is who can sign and who can verify, right? I want to make sure that only Alice can sign. And I want to make sure that everyone else can verify. So this is the main requirement. Only Alice can sign. But everyone can verify. OK, we will see tomorrow how we can do this, how we can come up with functions such that this signature function can only be computed by Alice, but the verification can be computed by anyone else. So basically, here what's going to happen is that 
instead of just sending the message, Alice sends the message and also her signature on the message to Bob, right? And now the idea is that, well, Charlie might try to change the message, but if, she, if he changes the message, he cannot forge the signature because only Alice can sign. Charlie cannot sign. So if he changes the message, Bob can figure out that the signature does not match. That's the idea. Okay, see you tomorrow.